Welcome to a McKenzie Institute Long Talk. There's a regular question that people ask after a disaster or an emergency. Why did it happen? How did it happen? How can we prevent it the next time? And often there is the hubris that we can prevent it the next time. Dr. Simon Bennett of Leicester University has been looking into crises and disasters for all his career, and he may have some answers. Welcome, Dr. Bennett. Hello. Uh, you talk about systems failure or the use of systemic analysis. Now, we know the word systemic, and we hear lay people talking <coughs> about systemic failures all the time, and we've heard of systems engineering. In, in what context are you using the term? In the sense that uh, disasters are frequently the result of uh, multiple failures, uh, as opposed to a single point of failure. So it's not just that um, O-ring or uh, thumb screw or gizmo, and it's not just a pilot error or uh, an error in judgment, it's a combination of things? It is indeed. Um, usually it's a whole range of different factors, uh, social, economic, and political. Um, the O-ring failure um, on Challenger is a very good example because uh, the decision to launch Challenger was made in part because of pressure applied uh, covertly by the White House. And I suppose all the people there, uh, the caterers, right through to all the dignitaries waiting for the launch, and boy, would you ever have been a stick in the mud if you canceled that launch. Absolutely. It was a very high-profile event. Uh, the Teacher in Space program was uh, extremely important to the Reagan administration. So behind the scenes, uh, there were great uh, pressures uh, to launch that mission. Now, that's um, <laughs> becoming a bit of ancient history now, the Challenger uh, explosion upon launch. Do you have any other examples of these uh, systemic failures where it's a combination of uh, people and uh, sociological factors and technology? Um, a good example would be the Lac Megantic uh, rail disaster in Canada, where um, lax government regulation, uh, which the government eventually acknowledged, um, played a part in that uh, dreadful rail disaster which killed so many people in Black Megantic. Well, and if there's uh, one of the many things I learned worth citing, the things I learned at Leicester University uh, studying under you, it's that there's a lot of blame to go around. So in Lac Megantic, uh, no doubt the city officials allowed pubs to be built and homes to be built up around a railway. Um, and um, they bear some responsibility as well, I assume. Yes, it's a whole syndrome of uh, organizational failures that stretches from uh, the city officials, local government, right up to the highest levels of Canada's national government. Um, it's a what we call a systems accident or systems failure. There isn't a single cause. There are numerous different divergent and very often hidden causes. Well, and that tells me that uh, mitigation is all that much more difficult because if you have to work through uh, the, the mountains of paper that there are in, in city government and, and provincial government, state government, uh, because after all that railway was owned in the United States, and then national governments, I mean, what hope do we have of, of really plowing through all that and reducing risk? One of the main problems with the systems approach is that it is very time intensive and labor intensive. If you're going to deconstruct a very complex causal system, that takes time, money, talent, effort, expertise. So it's very effortful. Um, so unless you're prepared to commit those resources, then you're not going to be able to perform a thorough systems analysis. 
Can you give me any, any examples of occasions where this has actually worked? Um, a very good example would be um, the uh, US Navy um, incidents uh, recently uh, with, for example, the USS John McCain um, being damaged. Um, the US Navy and the US Department of Defense actually conducted a very comprehensive systems thinking informed analysis, which turned up all sorts of unexpected factors. For example, that the training regime was so intensive that um, sailors uh, were becoming um, fatigued and so weren't able to perform um, at their optimal level. So to its credit, the US Department of Defense funded a very thorough detailed investigation of those uh, US naval incidents. And the report actually published by the Pentagon um, is very well worth reading. And I strongly recommend it to all those interested in systems thinking. And then there is the case of someone's excellent education or training being the seeds of crisis and disaster. I'm thinking that those uh, in the vernacular, <laughs> tough guy sailors and other men and women in uniform uh, wouldn't step forward and say, look, I'm getting fatigued with all this, uh, these exercises we're doing and I need a break. And, and they would, in, in part, sow the seeds of the disaster. Yes, very often you find, certainly in the armed forces, that the can-do mentality tends to override considerations of thoroughness and effectiveness. So the, the military can-do mentality, um, certainly in wartime, is a great asset, but also it can, uh, in peacetime, sow the seeds of, uh, of failure. So it's something that needs to be um, looked at very carefully. Kind of raises the issue that I think you did your original doctoral research uh, on about uh, Welsh coal miners, and that is uh, risk-taking versus risk-avoiding behavior. Can you speak a few words about that? Yes, actually, um, Alan, it was on uh, asbestos. So, yeah. Um, I looked at um, uh, asbestosis and the way in which uh, the industry treated uh, workers who claimed for cases of uh, asbestosis, yes. Um, somehow I have you associated with Wales. Did you go to school in Wales or what? why is yeah, my mother playing that trick on me? Yeah, I'm, I'm from Wales, from a, a coal mining town called Neath in South Wales. Well, uh, asbestos is a very important topic in Canada. It was a political issue in Quebec, and the asbestos strike yes. uh, helped uh, the rise of, among other people, Pierre Trudeau. So speak a bit about what you found out about uh, asbestosis. Yes, asbestos is an interesting mineral. Um, it has amazing properties, but one of the downsides is if you um, breathe it in or ingest it, it can cause a, a very painful, debilitating, and fatal cancer called mesothelioma. And over the years, there were numerous cases of mesothelioma that initially went uh, unrecognized and uncompensated by the industry. Eventually, the industry recanted after a number of high-profile court cases and started paying compensation to workers who were, by that time, dying from mesothelioma. Uh, but it took a concerted campaign by long-term sufferers to force the industry to recant and to commence paying uh, meaningful compensation. Well, bringing us back to risk-taking versus risk-avoiding behavior, I've had uh, workers doing a renovation in a home and they come upon old asbestos insulation and I remind them they have to get that uh, sealed in order to remove it safely. And I've had workers say, well, I'm strong and I'm tough and I've done this before and they're doing themselves 
for um, a few uh, bucks, as historically Pony Express riders did in the uh, American West, and as do nuclear jumpers who uh, get into a nuclear plant, do some repairs very quickly, and get a year's dosage of uh, radiation. What do, what do we do about that? That's part of the systemic problem that you're identifying, isn't it? Yes, I mean, the, the can-do mentality, the, the gung-ho mentality, is understandable, but it's potentially lethal. And as to what we can do about that, um, certainly education and training are extremely important within the context of effective government legislation and effective funding of safety campaigns. But education is the key. Very often in the past, workers weren't trained or educated in the risks they were taking and in the risks inherent in the materials they were working with. And that's certainly the case with um, asbestos. And it might help as well if um, campaigners were to mention that um, the actor Steve McQueen um, died from mesothelioma which he contracted when in the, the US Navy, working with lagging on US naval vessels. So perhaps um, that kind of high profile case uh, would help campaigners and the industry um, and safety advocates um, get their message across. Steve McQueen, a great actor whose life was tragically cut short by a very painful, a nasty form of cancer, mesothelioma. Now, one part of <clears throat> systemic failure used to simply be uh, technology working together, so-called interoperability. <clears throat> and we found uh, during 9-11 that the police couldn't talk to the <clears throat> fire department. Uh, their frequencies were different or their radios or other gizmos were different. <clears throat> and, uh, that became a source of, of uh, proper outrage. Interoperability now also means communication terminology, which uh, is different in different jurisdictions and different response agencies. Um, that leads me back to Lac McGinnis, <coughs> where the president of the company came to the uh, small town in Quebec and held an impromptu news conference. Uh, I don't think anyone would think it was a competently held news conference in the middle of the street, no French capability, could have used a local lawyer or priest to help him communicate to the locals. And then I find uh, very, very common, spokespeople in these incidents will contradict themselves within one sentence. And he said, we think we know why this happened. Uh, and we are also mad that we haven't been allowed on the site to examine. Now, that's sort of a ridiculous convergence of opinions. We know what happened, but we haven't been allowed to see the scene. Um, is that, that's my favorite part of systemic failure, the ability of people to speak about the incident that either they caused or they're trying to mitigate. What's your view? I think it's very important when we have uh, major disasters, major losses, and subsequent uh, uh, investigations, it's very important not to get involved in conjecture. Very often, as we've seen with the, um, the Boeing 737 um, MAX 8 uh, uh, crashes, um, numerous people who think they know what happened will speculate. And that's very dangerous because those individuals, they may be well-intentioned, they may have the interests of the, the victims or the manufacturer at heart, but they aren't in possession of the full facts. And until those full facts are known, until they are revealed in a rational and considered way by the official investigating parties, then persons um, should really um, keep quiet and not speculate and not seek to muddy the waters. Well, it's funny, my observation is that they are in uh, possession of something more dangerous, and that is hopes, uh, goals, aspirations, <coughs> beliefs, suppositions, uh, speculation, etc. When what they could do is simply talk exactly about how you go about running a railroad or an airline or <coughs> flying a plane or driving a, uh, a truck or a tractor trailer 
uh, or um, a, a locomotive, and this would satisfy the public, the politicians, the inquiries, the news media, until more was found. Uh, your view on that? I absolutely agree. I think um, if somebody has a particular point of view or a particular type of expertise, um, instead of going to the media, instead of talking to the television people, instead of going onto the radio, they should instead contact the investigating team and in confidence um, convey what they know to the investigators and not blurt it out on national media. That is counterproductive. If you have knowledge, if you have insight, then the social, the responsible thing to do is to talk to the investigators. Now, Dr. Simon Bennett, uh, the McKenzie Institute is interested in security and safety in all of its broad meaning and you've touched on many aspects of that. However, it is impossible to summarize a scholarly book in 15 or so minutes, and it's impossible to summarize your lifelong career studying this. So I'm admitting, admitting my uh, failings, the errors and omissions. What uh, should we have talked about? What are some things that uh, you want uh, the people who are interested in McKenzie's approach to safety and security to know about? I think it's very important when there are disasters, it's very important to seek to understand the social, economic, and especially the political context in which they occur. Um, politicians across the world are, are lawmakers. They make the laws, they make the rules and regulations within which corporations um, perform and do their thing. Um, usually, when there's a disaster, um, questions are rarely asked of our lawmakers, of our rule makers, of our politicians, of our prime ministers, of our presidents. That seems to me to be an injustice to the people who are most directly involved in the disaster. Usually, politicians who make the rules, who make the, the laws, get away scot-free. That, to me, is morally indefensible. The challenger launch decision was made within a very heated political context, political environment, yet there was no comeback on the White House, it seems to me. That seems to me to be a great injustice to the astronauts who died on that uh, space shuttle. So it's very important um, to question politicians, but equally to have a means of doing that. If you don't have the means of holding politicians to account, if you don't have a free press, if you don't have a free media, then your chances of doing that are severely limited. Look, for example, what happens in China, in China's coal mines, which have a, a perfectly awful safety record. Why? Partly because the Chinese media is not a free media. They don't have a free press. They don't ask probing questions of their corrupt politicians and um, functionaries. And that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, a free society is generally a safer society than a totalitarian society. And we see that in China. Well, indeed, and there's a... Um uh, recent New York Times bestseller, Why Nations Fail, and uh, that would be congruent with your view. Uh, they succeed with uh, freedom and openness and plurality yes. and what have you. Uh, Dr. Bennett, I know from personal experience uh, over the past 20 years that your work has helped keep uh, more people safer in many countries, and you have hundreds and hundreds of students that you've uh, tutored and graduated, uh, and Luster University gets its uh, share of the credit. So uh, thank you. I hope you stay at it forever. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. I wish you all the very best. 
Any views expressed here are not necessarily those of the McKenzie Institute, its speakers, sponsors, or supporters. But the Institute is dedicated to fostering public discussion, debate, and education about security matters. Google the McKenzie Institute to join the discussion. The McKenzie Institute is grateful to its sponsors and supporters. Some of our short pods and long talks are a result of the support of Heathbridge Capital Management Limited, the National Post, and Dundurn Publishing.